Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the show. Today, I bring you a conversation between myself and Derek Tate. Derek's background is very much grounded in sports and particularly alpine skiing, which is why I reached out to him in the first place. As many of you may or may not know, my background actually comes from coaching in skiing before I got into life and business coaching. So I obviously resonated with Derek on that level, and his coaching of sport developed into him coaching across a number of domains, including positive psychology and sports psychology as well. So I was very interested to hear him talk about that. He graduated with a master's in applied positive psychology in 2019 from Buckinghamshire University in the UK, and that led him to developing his coaching practice and writing a number of self-help and psychology books, which have become very, very popular. This is a conversation not to be missed. It's very relaxed and very conversational, and we really get into the heart of a number of key issues around flow, around productivity, and around mindset. So I think that you can take a lot away from this episode. I know that I did, and without further ado, let's jump right into it. Derek, welcome. So glad that you could take the time to do this with me. I've really been looking forward to having this conversation. Great. Thank you very much, James. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it myself. So yeah, thanks for having me along. My pleasure. You know, I came across you on the Ski Instructor podcast because I'm an ex-ski instructor, as some of my audience may or may not know. And then off the back of that, started listening to a number of your other podcasts and really got into some of the kind of information and tactics you had around life coaching, mindset, mindfulness, and all of that stuff. And I thought, wow, this is somebody that aligns exactly with what I do. Ski instructor and a life coach. That's a perfect combination. What is it that took you from skiing to life coaching? I'm curious. Well, I guess skiing had been been my kind of thing for such a long time and it, you know it still is I'm still still working as a ski instructor during the winter but I guess I was getting to that kind of age where you think right what well, you know I'm getting older now the body's not going to maybe hold up as well as it did when I was in my 20s you know and I'm getting into the later years what else am I going to do and I, I was always interested in the psychology side of things in terms of psychology of learning and I've been involved in the education of uh, instructors as well so that that whole kind of how people learn and was was of real interest to me so yeah I, I embarked on a, a master's degree in positive psychology after turning 50 so and that that was probably sort of a kind of midlife crisis of, of a sort but it was it was definitely the best thing I ever did to go on that course it was an absolutely brilliant course to do and yeah that just completely changed it it just it was this stuff I'd never done before, if you like, you know, and, and that I'd always want to do in psychology. So that, that gave me a new perspective on how to even teach people mm -hmm. within the sport of skiing. But then obviously my, my main goal was to find out where else I could take it and bringing in to the sort of life coaching side of things and to, you know, just coaching people in general, you know, and I think it, it, it also then coincided with, with, you know, lockdowns and COVID and all this sort of stuff. So yeah. that maybe prompted me as well to do more stuff. You know, I got into writing as well and, and just kind of developing the whole other side of, of my business. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the, uh, initially I'd say why I ended up going in the direction of I'm in now. Yeah. It's really interesting because when you share that, I was just thinking about from the beginning of your career, which was obviously kind of related to the ski industry and where you are now, it seems like you've always been helping people to achieve something, whether that's to achieve better performance on skis or whether it's to achieve better work-life balance or better mindfulness or to have a more positive outlook on life. What is it about helping other people that's so important for you? Well, I think if, if I think of the sport initially, it's, it's, it's the realization that the sport can do so much for people beyond the techniques of the sport itself, you know, so you, people come out on a, on a trip to the Alps and, you know, some people have, they've never been in that kind of environment before. So you suddenly, the whole things of mindfulness and, and just enjoying the moment of where you are sort of come into it. And, and then you realize there's so much more that you can help people with beyond just learning a particular skill. And I think that's, that's what, I guess I'd really always known that, but you know, going on a course and, and sort of something like positive psychology, you start, start to examine yourself a lot, you know, quite, it's quite a reflective period. So you're thinking back through through your own career. And, and then it's that realization that there was actually an awful lot more to to what I was doing all the way along than I perhaps even realized. And, and that, I guess, just makes it even more exciting going forward, you know, to think that you can make a difference to people to their lives, you know, and just, you know, help them see, see the positives and the, and the possibilities really that are out there. 
Mm. Something you talk a lot about is the positives, whether it's positive psychology or you just talked about actually helping people to see the positives. What is it about looking at things in a positive way that helps people to improve their ability in a range of domains? It's, I suppose, positive in one sense. It's a bad word. It's good and bad. It depends how it's perceived, you know. And I think when, when positive psychology sort of came to the fore in around 2000, it, you know, there was a period of time where it was just seen as something with smiley emojis and things like that, and lots of <laughs> book titles with positive in it. And of course, it's not just that. It's it's more about being able to deal with the negative and reframe it and and see the possibilities. So it's it's not positive in the sense of just pretending that the the challenges don't exist and it, it's very much just how how you can see what what's available out there and and look at something from a different angle so it's there's more depth i suppose behind the positive than just just that word itself if if that makes sense yeah yeah no that makes a lot of sense because what was running through my head then was many situations in the past where the they could be classed as stressful situations whether it's you know heading into an exam or under a high pressure sports environment and I remember thinking about all the the negative things that were going through my head about what if I do something embarrassing what if I make a mistake what if I don't win you know not winning was a big problem for me because I really wanted to win and all that did was kind of make me like fearful and I definitely had a massive decline in performance off the back of that and I always found it really difficult to grasp the idea of fake it till you make it and I'm still (laughs) trying to establish whether that's something that's actually beneficial or whether that's just hogwash or maybe it works for some people and not for others I'd love to get your take on that yeah I don't uh, yeah it's hard to sort of answer though and fake it till I make it It, I suppose what I have learned is that everybody's unique everybody's different and and your your sort of mental skills that you need and your mental direction it's it's very individual and it's about finding out what works for you so you know, for some people, fake it till you make it might be the the way to for that to happen. But I think for me, a lot of it is is also about people being able to, you know, if you're talking about performance, whether that's in sport or on the job, it's it's about being able to to stay on task. It's about being able to be present. And as we know, there's there's lots of talk about that in the media these days about the distractions that are out there so people can't really just stay in the moment and actually enjoy the experience of what they're doing you know and, and you hear about that all the time obviously in sport where people are just trying to stay as they would term in the zone but I think that just goes across so much of life is can we actually enjoy what we're doing rather than always be thinking about what's next or what if as you as you said you know what if this goes wrong or I don't perform well or or somebody thinks, you know, I'm making a mess of it and, you know, feeling embarrassed. And and I guess that's why when I got into positive psychology, I was drawn to flow as a as a construct and as an idea because it was it was as I said, I used the term in the zone already, which is if if you like the athlete's way of describing flow. And it is just that. It's about being fully immersed in the activity that you're doing. But it's usually an activity that has a challenge to it, whether that's mental or physical or a combination of both, you know, so, so finding that ability to get into flow, I think is is really important for um, not just for being productive and performing well, but because it, it also brings a lot of sort of mental health benefits with it as well. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, I don't know if I've gone off track now from your original question. (laughs) Very happy to go off track and very happy to talk about flow because I don't know, so many things you say are just like sparking my curiosity. It's like when you talk about flow and then you were previously talking about distractions, it was just, I was wondering, and I don't have the data to hand, but maybe maybe you believe. Do you believe that people had more flow, say 50 years ago when there wasn't an iPhone next to me on my desk when I'm working with Instagram right there that I can just start scrolling? I, I certainly think it was easier in the past to to sort of focus on things and I, I you know I, I'm obviously as I said over the age of well I'm 57 now so I can think back to before mobile phones and before email and you know to the times where we actually wrote letters so so I can at least have some memory of these times and clearly yeah there, there is so much more distraction now you know and you have all your notifications on your phone and stuff like that and it's just constantly bombarding you and it, it's just the human nature that we're 
you know, so if you hear something or your phone buzzes or whatever, you're, you instantly want to go and look at it. You know, so you really do have to, I think, work harder to stay present. You have to almost think more about your environment and setting it up in a way that allows you to actually stay on task. And that that's that's definitely a challenge. You know, and maybe maybe we need to actually be allowing ourselves at times to be distracted because, you know, we don't want to be in a flow state all of the time. That That's not what I'm suggesting and it's not, that wouldn't be healthy either. It's so that it's almost giving yourself permission to, if you want to be distracted or if you want to have a period where you're just mind wandering, you know, if, I, if I'm going out for a hike in the mountains, as I love to do, then, you know, I almost need to decide, do, do I want that hike in the mountains to be about being mindful and being just with nature and with the, the place that I am? Or am I going on the walk because I want to actually think about stuff, you know, and, and let thoughts just race through and see where my thinking goes, you know? So, you know, perhaps I can do it, split that up on the walk as well and do a period of I'm just going to, you know, because walking can be a great time to go and think about stuff. But equally, sometimes we're so caught up in our thoughts, we forget to enjoy where we actually are. You know, and I'm I'm lucky enough to live right in the Alps near Chamonix, and it's it's a fantastic place. So you know, it'd be a real shame to go out there and and miss it. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear you put it like that. When when you were describing that, I was just thinking about like I do a lot of running, right? So like long distance running. Yeah, it's unbearable not to listen to a podcast while I'm on my <laughs> run. You know, it's like maybe because of my age, like I'm. I'm 30 years old. I've had an yeah. iPhone since I think 13 years old. And before then, I was always playing PlayStation. So there's never really been a time where I haven't been able to like lean on electronics or music or noise as a way to distract myself from my own thoughts. And yeah. the amount of time that I spend with my own thoughts has gotten shorter and shorter. And then when I do spend time with my own thoughts, it's become more and more unbearable because... I feel like my brain just getting busier and busier. It's almost like mm. I have all of these thoughts and they're not being allowed to escape. And there's like a pressure cooker and they're, they're all like trapped. And then you have like 10 minutes of silence and all of these thousands of thoughts are all trying to like work yeah. their way out at the same time, you know? And, and that kind of comes down to when people say well, the best way to do it is meditation. And it's like, yeah. well, if I sit down in that 10 minutes, my brain's like pretty wild, you know? Um, sure. And, and maybe that's the goal. I don't know. But it's, yeah. I guess everything in life, though, so it, it's it's what we practice, isn't it? You know, it's what we do regularly and and repeat. So if 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 that repetition is always having an electronic device that you lean on or you listen to something and you have noise, then that's what you're getting used to. So it's not surprising mm. then when we go and try and meditate that it, you know the mind is just you know so busy and it's as you say yourself, it's unbearable. But, you know, I think that's why I always say to people about meditation as well, well be, you have to be patient with yourself, you know, and don't, don't just try it once and say, oh, that didn't work for me. So, yeah, I'm not going to do that. You know, you just have to keep trying it little bits at a time and, and, and see if it, you can gradually get some benefit from it. But it's certainly not going to be instant as, and if, if you're not used to it. So, but, but practice yeah, I... certainly is the key in anything, really. Yeah, 100% agree with you there. And my belief is that a lot of people go wrong where they feel like they're failing if they're thinking too much. But in reality, maybe what they need to do is think, you know, I, I've been experimenting a little bit myself with in the morning, like having a 10 minute walk just up the road and back, but in silence so that I can actually allow myself to get out some of the thoughts that are trapped. And I'm not <clears throat> trying to even control my thoughts. I'm just thinking about whatever it is that I need to think about so that I can calm whatever anxieties are, are trapped there and, and yeah. let them go and i yeah, found no, that to be really beneficial yeah i think that sounds like a, a good strategy you know as well because you're not i think people make the mistake of thinking that meditation and, and particularly mindfulness which is just a form of meditation or can be a form of meditation they, they think it's about sort of trying to not allow yourself to think and it's trying to clear the mind but it, that isn't what it is about getting more comfortable observing your thoughts without necessarily getting, you know, drawn down a rabbit hole. And, you know, can you let the thoughts almost pass by? And as you say, get get them out. So it's it's not, it's more about bringing, I, I like the term bringing order to consciousness rather than having a, a monkey mind that's all over the place. And so it's, 
yeah, it's it it's not about emptying the mind necessarily. It's it's just about getting a bit more order and clarity within it. Mm. Just to get a grip for like where I stand in terms of the general population of how well I'm able to meditate. Not how well, but what the kind of percentage is between noisy brain and quiet brain. I would say that about 10% of the time I can get quiet brain and 90% of the time is noisy brain. What's the kind of metrics or percentage? It's, it's not, that you yeah, it's, it's, really... it's, it's a good question. It's, it's something I'd have to go and look up. Actually, it's not it's not a statistic I've come across. I, but I, you know, I know from doing meditations, you know, a lot in the past, and you know, I've done a lot of the sort of guided meditations where you're being guided by well-known, you know, teachers of of meditation practice, and and they're, you know, the big thing that's coming across all the time is you've got to be patient with yourself. You aren't, you know, the some of them talk about just just can you actually just focus fully on one full in breath and out breath and so if they're if they're suggesting that it's that difficult to do just one breath then what it's suggesting is that a lot of the population really struggle to to stay in a, a meditative state for any period of time so as i wouldn't imagine you are on typical of you know a lot of people so but yeah, you, you've got to be patient with yourself. You've got to be compassionate, you know, to yourself and and, and not expect that you'll just instantly be able to do it. Mm. But Derek, don't you need to do at least 20 minutes per day to get any benefit? Again, you know, that there's different schools of thought and that it's a bit like anything's better than nothing. You know, and again, I've had, even when I did, I did a meditation and mindfulness teacher course. And when I did that training, you know, some of the guided meditations are one minute long. So if they're if they're actually doing recorded guided meditations, anything from one minute upwards, then, you know, that again is obviously suggesting that you can meditate for different lengths of time. You know, to do 20 minutes or more, yes, it would be great if you can, but it, that's, it's quite a, it's quite a tough a tough ask i think as you get more into it yeah you, you can then even go away in retreats and spend a whole week doing it but you know in reality i think for most people if you can just do five minutes 10 minutes you're probably doing quite well yeah the bar- the barrier to entry for these things is often a lot lower than what we believe and or sometimes is what we're led to believe and i feel like that puts people off even starting at the beginning and to a lot of us then meditation sounds very daunting i think we have a split population on this where one half think it's kind of like woo woo and it's all sitting around cross-legged outside doing Uh yoga retreat kind of stuff or or related to some kind of religious activity and then we have another half who believe that this is the thing that changes the world you need to do at least an hour of it a day and life's going to be perfect and everything's easy and and it's really great and I struggle to find people that have a good balance with it in the middle some of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think as well, it, it, it's maybe going slightly off track or maybe not. It's, it's again, people often confuse mindfulness and meditation and, and sort of find it hard to differentiate the two. And I think what I already said was mindfulness is one form of meditation. There are many forms of meditation. You know, you could have Vipassana, Chakra, body scan, you know, there are all kinds of different types of meditation. But you can also be mindful in your day to day life, you know, and that that's, again, more about are you actually staying focused and with the activity that you're doing, even if it's quite mundane? Can you actually be present with that activity? And the example from my own sport, which which was part of my research, was I looked at how mindful people could be when riding a ski lift. Because that that's something that you have to do, as as you know, being a skier is it's a big part of your day. Is you're you're going up and down lifts, and sometimes you're on a lift by yourself, and other times you're on a lift with other people. And what I came up with was a, an intervention where people had different activities that they would do if they were on their own. So they had five different activities, which were just more mindful meditative activities during the time they're on the lift. And then if they were with other people, they were mindful communication activities. So they were actually being present with the person they were communicating with. So, you know, I think when you differentiate this mindfulness from the meditative version to the everyday life stuff, I I think it helps to bring some clarity to it. 
I don't know if that sounds sensible to you, but it certainly helped me. Yeah, it sounds a lot more accessible when you put it like that. You spoke about mindful communication, and that's Hmm. a term that I've never heard before or never put much thought into it. But it's fascinating that you say that because as a coach, then I'm mindfully communicating with the coachee who's on the other side of the call. And a lot of the time I get the feeling that maybe I'm the only person that has mindfully communicated with that person that day or maybe even that week. Yeah. Because it's very difficult now to get people to actually listen to us for a concerted amount of time and actually be present in what we're saying and our story without any agenda of of what they're going to say back in response to that. Mm. What's been your experience around actually people going out and mindfully communicating with everyone in their lives, whether it's family members, friends, what difference does that make to people's lives? I, th- I think it can make a huge difference. You know, I, I found when I did this research and, and my research was with ski instructors. So it was, they're, they're a unique type of person, as you can imagine, uh, you know, mm-hmm. to be a an instructor in a sport, you have to be quite, you know, fairly strong willed, opinionated, confident. And I think in these roles, sometimes we're a lot of roles in life, we're very good at, if you like, pretending to listen in the sense we listen in order to reply, but we don't really listen in order to understand, you know, and that, and that, and that, that's not something I've just come up with that. That's something, you know, you can go back in time and, and various people have said that in the past. Uh, I think Carl Rogers, probably from the humanistic psychology back in the sixties was probably one who said that. And it is about so for me, mindful communication, if so mindful listening, for example, would be that. Are you listening to really understand the person and what they're telling you? Or are you simply listening so you can think, what am I going to say in return? And if you take that into, you know, all areas of life, I think it's a very helpful way. And certainly that was a response I got from interviewing some of my research participants was that the mindful activities that I had given them to use on the ski lifts with each other And with their, you know, with the students that they're working with, they were actually reporting that it was really helpful in other areas of life, in family life and, you know, in work outside of skiing. So, yeah, I think that that for me, that mindful listening as a part of mindful communication is is really, really important. Hmm. Why do you believe people aren't listening mindfully to to other people around them? Yeah, it's a good question. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sorry. I suppose we're always wanting to reply, you know, and get the reply right. Maybe we need to feel our our own voices being heard. You know, so often in discussions, we want to get a, we want to get our point across. You know, a, a lot of a lot of stuff in in our modern world is people aren't aren't terribly open to other people's opinions. I mean, we, you know, that's one of the downsides of social media. I guess we people are so happy to put in their their opinion, whereas they might find be you know more careful about what they say if they were actually face to face with somebody else but mm. but yeah i don't know is it insecurity or just you know feeling that you don't get listened to yourself so you have to put your own point across more strongly yeah i'm not not entirely sure maybe you have a different opinion about it yeah when you speak about it like that it's interesting because i was coming back to the word flow it's almost like this block in being willing to accept the other person's opinion then stops the back and forth flow of ideas and opinion Mm -hmm. and conversation and it puts the brakes on all of that and it's also stopping the flow of progression within society and we're becoming more and more split and less and less together Mm -hmm. Uh, people have very strong opinions on whether it's left and right politics or otherwise And in reality, I still have a belief that most people sit in that gray area of the middle in the middle where they take some benefit from either side. But somehow we seem to be driven into this polarizing state of mind where we must make sure that everybody agrees with our opinion and it becomes tribal. And then that means that people go into conversations with very strong agendas. And when we do that, then it's very difficult for us to understand what the other person is trying to say in the conversation because I don't really want to hear them speak. I just want to get my turn to say what I need to say to try and convince them yeah. that my way is the right way. 
And that's something that I personally have battled with a lot about actually accepting that I'm not an expert in every situation and there's people that are more talented than me in every domain of life. Yeah. And I can learn something from every single individual, no matter what certification they have or no matter what job they have or no matter what life experience they have. And that's something that I started to develop, ironically, towards the end of my skiing career because growing up as a skier when I was when I was kind of in my late teens and early 20s, it was all a big competition. It was all who can do the biggest jump, who can go fastest around these race gates, who's going to deliver the best practice teaching session in this exam. Everything was a competition and it was one against the other. And all that did was made me agitated, anxious, fearful that I was going to make a mistake and do something stupid. And in the end, it stopped me from participating a lot of, in a lot of things because I felt overwhelmed to even put myself in those situations. Yeah. As I grew up towards the end of my skiing career, as I matured a little bit, I started to be able to relax, accept where my shortcomings were, and then take advice from people that were more talented than me. And yeah. not only that, but actually seek out people that were more talented than me and ask them, hey, can you have a look at what I'm doing? Do you have any pointers on what I could do better? Yeah. Not only does, did that make me a better skier and a better all-round person in general, but I also added value to the person who I was asking for help. Because let's face it, there's nothing better than being asked for help. There's yeah. nothing better than one of your peers looking at you and saying, you're an expert, can you give me some advice on what to do? Sure. Everyone walks away from that conversation happy. It took me 10 years to learn that, mm. and it was a challenging road to get there. And now I've tried to take that attitude forward into other areas of my life, whether it's having this conversation with yourself, whether it's people who I'm coaching, I'm there to coach them, but I'm also trying to learn from them. What are they doing well in life? How well is their business doing? What tactics are they using to improve their mindfulness that's working for them? And then going into life with that idea of not pushing my agenda and not pushing my ideas forth, but instead trying to absorb the ideas of others and then adapt them to my own life and implement them, seeing whether they work or not, has actually made me a lot less stressed out, a lot less intense, a yeah. lot less anxious, and a lot more intelligent because I've learned so much more stuff. And that's been like a real breakthrough for me. And it's said goodbye to a lot of the arguments that I would have with people. A lot of the one-upmanship that happens in in every aspect of life, whether it's sport yeah. or business or whatever, or a lot of the showboating that happens around the pub table with your mates at six p.m. about who's got this and who's got that. Yeah, and okay. that's just not a life that I would want to go back to after I've experienced that change. When you approach your life, how do you approach learning from other people and having these kind of conversations? I, th well, I think there's a lot of what you've just said there that you know, totally resonates with me as well. And in terms of, you know, I think I've always had mentors along the way and I always, you know, sought mentors even from early on in my, my skiing career. So I don't think I've ever had a, an issue with sort of recognizing that, you know, people are better. And I, I guess I've not been as competitive. I didn't enjoy the competitive environment either you know and as you were saying that wasn't something that was a driver for me you know and so the more i can compete against myself rather than others the better you know and that, that that's probably one of the things i try to live by i'm trying to improve my own performance and prove my own existence if you want to call it that but it's but yeah i mean coming back to i think life is just so much more interesting if you're interested in other people as well and can learn from other people and, and and as as you were talking about there, just just that willingness to to be open to what other people bring, you know, whether it's somebody you're coaching or you know, whether that's an online conversation or whether it's face to face or whether it's a sport, you know, it's just just having a real genuine interest in the other person. You know, apart from what you might learn from them, it's just just getting getting more about their lives. That that just makes it so much richer, I suppose. Yeah. So it's yeah. Yeah, it's it's lose the ego really, and I think that that's another reason flow is good because you know when you are in a flow state, you lose the ego. You know, again, you are immersed in what you're doing. You're not thinking about 
I want to beat the other person. You're just focused on doing that task. So, you know, it's another reason why it's a beneficial state to get into. Yeah. You were talking then about the the competition with others and the ego state versus Mm. the competition with self and the love of learning and then the subsequent flow states that comes from that. And they seem like two different mental mental efforts that could be used in order to be successful in any genre. For example, I'm not sure if this is optimal in every area of life, but I bet there's a lot of people who are so desperate to beat their peers at something that they manage to gain what society would deem of as a massive amount of success in any given area, whether that's sport or business. And I personally previously have felt that driver to succeed because Mm. I don't want to be left behind or because I do want to keep up with the Joneses. And I feel like they can both work, but, and I want to get your take on this, but for me personally, when I do the competition side of things, that's when the success isn't even worth it because the headache is just unbearable. Whereas if I can do it in the flow way, then I feel connected to the people around me. I actually enjoy what I'm doing and I put a lot less pressure on myself and I don't feel stressed out. Sometimes I feel like I I really want to do the flow state one because I know that's the beneficial one. Yeah. But I get dragged backwards into the competition side of things and it's really difficult to stay out of that, especially with things like social media where there's always someone who's doing what you're doing but better and you've got to look at it every day. Or there's always somebody that's got more money than you or a more successful business than you. There's always somebody we can look to and feel envious of and then have that desperation to try and overcome them. What kind of advice do you have for people who feel like they're in that competition, overcome everyone else, win at all costs mindset, who would actually like to try and shift themselves more towards a flow state, accepting their own situation, being at one with the task, way of actually achieving their goals i think uh, yeah it's it's so interesting listening to to your sort of take on your your own personal experiences because you said things like i want to get back to enjoying what i'm doing and and i suppose it is that are you actually enjoying the process or are you always striving for the goal you know and the the outcome and the the two are both important so i'm not i'm not going to suggest that we shouldn't have you know goals to reach towards you know, and and to have an outcome that we're trying to achieve. And that might mean being better than somebody else. Of course it might. And it's reaching a standard. So that that is definitely, it's part of life. But if that starts to take over, so it's the overriding thing and you then don't enjoy the process of getting there, that's when I think, you know, you're getting the balance wrong. And and that's when it it, it messes things up. And And I think back on my own career, I've had, huge goals you know i wanted to get to the top level qualification in skiing which was was almost always my goal and and, and, you know when i think back of the intermediate stages as i went there i i probably enjoyed getting the lower qualifications much more than the final one because by the time i got to the final one it was it was i'd forgotten to enjoy part of the journey (laughs) you know i was so focused on getting and reaching that goal so it's yeah I, i think my advice to somebody was is remember to your it's a journey and the journey is often more important than the destination and that's a bit of a cliche i know you, you see people write that and say that all the time but it it is actually true when you when i reflect on my own life as well you know and, and I, I i've become more relaxed now but maybe that's just maturity because when you're younger you're also striving you're at that time in your career where you're trying to to get somewhere and to achieve things and and sometimes the way the way things are structured in the industry you're in it's it is competitive so it's it's maybe difficult to completely manage that you know you see that in in the corporate world where there's only so many promotional opportunities where people are vying for that opportunity to get promoted so so there is competition there but i think it all i'd say is is step back and look and 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 try and get a balance so that you definitely are engaged in the process as well as in the as the looking to the outcome mm. whether that i don't know if that makes sense or answers the question it makes a lot of sense and i'm 
thinking about this relationship between goal and journey and then i'm thinking all the way back to the beginning when you're at the start line yeah and we're often told well when you're at the beginning you need to choose a goal and then the journey is just it's just a way of getting to the destination but the way you you explain it the journey is so much more than that the journey itself is supposed to be enjoyable mm. the journey the is journey you, yeah it, or it, it it should be you know and if it is then that it's so much more rewarding when you get there it, it, if if the journey has been fun you know and again as but that's why i guess i'll use my master's degree as an example you know so i go on a master's degree age of 50 i hadn't done an undergrad degree i hadn't gone to university you know come out of school and gone into sort of some dead end jobs before becoming a ski instructor so then I go and do a master's degree. Well, there's so much I had to learn on that course. And, you know, you talk about imposter syndrome. I arrived on the course and I'm, I'm there with people who've got psychology degrees, psych, psychiatry qualifications, you know, endless, endless amounts of highly academic qualified people. And here I am, a ski instructor, <laughs> thinking I'm going to do a master's degree. So that was incredibly daunting. But when I think back, I took a three-year track to get that master's degree. I enjoyed every minute of it, you know, and, and just the whole part of being with the cohort. And I, I would be going over to weekends once a month for the, as part of the course. And that, that was in just near, outside London. It was, you know, just a, a wonderful experience to go and do that. And it was a sort of a break from the, the life I have out here. But it, you know, I think back the friendships I made, the the conversations we had, uh, you know, the discussions, uh, even the social events we went to, all of that was what made it, you know. And because I was relaxed into it, and yes, there was a huge amount of work involved, and and there was a certain amount of stress of passing assignments and getting there. But it, you know, in the end, I I came out with flying colours, having never even picked up a research article before I went there. So it's, you know. I can honestly say that that journey I fully enjoyed and was as successful in that outcome as I've been in anything I'd done in my life prior to that, and probably much more so than I'd been in, in my skiing career when I was going through the qualifications. But as a, as a total goal and journey, that was a much greater achievement in my life than the, you know, the ski instructor qualifications where, yes, I achieved a great level. And, and, but I wouldn't have said I, I enjoyed the process as much at all. That's fascinating to hear. It's like when we set goals, then we need to actually establish whether the journey is one that's actually tolerable and mm. not even tolerable, but enjoyable. Yeah. I this think it's just about having the goal. Yeah. And yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, it's, wrong to say that you know the journey can be enjoyable it doesn't mean it won't be hard work you know or there's a lot of effort to be expended along the way but why shouldn't it be enjoyable <laughs> you, know, you know why shouldn't our jobs be enjoyable <laughs> and, and that that's a mindset in itself you know where we come out of so much of society tells us that work isn't enjoyable and leisure is but you know, the reality is studies have shown that people get into a flow state far more frequently in work than they do in leisure. So, you know, how, how does that work if people are then saying that, well, I just want to get to leisure time, you know, and, and you take that to the other end of the thing and what happens to people at the end of life? Well, they, they retire and then within, you know, for a lot of people within a short period of time, they, they're physically incapacitated. They, they come down with whatever illnesses and they're, and then off they go, they pop their clogs and they're gone. <laughs> so it's, yeah. you know, so we need to be engaged in, you know, activities that are interesting, that are enjoyable, but are, are also stretching us physically and mentally, you know, and, and work often is what provides that. But work can be enjoyable. I think that would be. But Derek. <laughs> That's easy for you to say. You spend all day skiing around on the mountain and stuff. What about for the rest of us who are stuck behind desks doing tasks that our boss says that we have to do? How do we get into a flow state in that situation and make life enjoyable? I think, I think, uh, I mean, in one sense, yes, you say it's, it's easy 
because it's always easy to look from the outside and, and look at somebody else's job and say, oh, well, that's just wonderful, you know, and, and social media can also paint a very, very convenient picture of what's wonderful, you know. So and I, as a ski instructor, I have that opportunity every day, don't I, when I'm on the mountain to post a lovely picture in, in a fantastic environment. And But you can also only post the good stuff on social media. <laughs> it's not a true reflection of life and what goes on in the background. So, you know, I know plenty of, plenty of examples of, you know, people who are, who have been the most depressed to the point of committing suicide were people who were either working in a ski resort or ski instructors. Because when you look at the life as a totality, you think, well, they live in this amazing, beautiful place, wonderful environment, but they're actually not making that much money and compared to the guests that are coming into the area with loads and loads of money and who are really wealthy, they're just struggling to get by. So then you start to look at their life as a as a whole and think, well, it's not as nice as you think. So as I say, it's just so easy to just look from the outside at somebody's life and then go, well, that must be wonderful. But it, but that isn't always the case. And I think then if you, I think the other part of your question was there, well, what if your job is more mundane or and you've been given tasks by your boss to do? I mean, to a certain extent, you have to then think about how you can be creative about doing those tasks. You know, and that that's where we talk about strengths, for example. If, if you can understand what your strengths are, then you can sometimes apply those strengths to different tasks that you're doing. And so it does take a little bit of, as I say, creativity in that sense. But, you know, some of the things that are strengths for me, and you touched on them earlier, love of learning, for example, is, is a something that I've come to know as a strength. So it's, you can, you can then try and take a mindset of, well, if I'm having to do this task, that's, you know, a bit more mundane, what, what can I get from it? You know, what can I learn from it? So in, in some way, try and apply the strength to the task. And, and again, that's sort of reframing or resetting how you, how you approach it. Mm. The way you describe it, the relationship between strengths and enjoyment from the other side of the conversation, it comes across to say people normally have more enjoyment when they're able to work on things that they're strong at. How accurate is that statement? Yeah, I suppose it depends how you define strong at. I think it's, we obviously enjoy doing things if we're, if we have a degree of competency, you know, or, or, or skill, that that's one aspect, but it, it's got to be more than that. It's got to be something that we genuinely enjoy and and the the word that i like is is energy if we're feeling alive and energized from doing something it's so much better than you know just feeling you're having to get it done even if you're even if you are quite good at it and and we'll all have things that we we can do that we're we're pretty competent we've learned how to do them but you know i i hate doing accounts you know and it's part of the business and being self-employed as i have been for you don't have to do my accounts you know so but it's not something I particularly enjoy. But but there are times in life where we have to do these these jobs, if you like, which are not as enjoyable. So it's it's about trying to structure things so you're spending enough time doing the things that do give you energy and that do kind of uplift you. So it's you know you talked about enjoying writing, you know, so that that presumably is something that that you get you know, some, some energy or excitement from as well, or, or good feelings afterwards, you know, perhaps it's something that you can find flow in because you just get immersed in it. And it's, you're just totally, you know, certainly when I've been writing in the past, you, you know, I'll have that experience where you get into it and you're, you're re interested in finding out the research that supports what you're doing. And you, you go away and next thing you look and uh, two hours have gone by and you don't know what happened to the time. So it's, you know, it, it's, it is finding the tasks that you enjoy, but also finding ways to do tasks to make them more enjoyable as well. So it's a little bit of both, I guess. Yeah. And when you were talking about that, I was thinking back to the times where I'm writing and I feel like two days, one after the other, same task. One day I have flow, one day terrible flow, can't do anything, frustrated, distracted. Yeah. Why is it different like that from one day to the next? I I mean, it, it is, I suppose is what I would say. And it's, that's part of us being human, unfortunately. And, and I think the more you, you try to force something like flow, the more elusive it becomes, you know, so it, yeah, you know, people talk about being able to engineer flow to happen. And 
And the way I see it is you can create the environment to make it more likely to happen. But it's not a switch you can flick. You can't just, I'm going to flick the switch and I'm in flow. It, it, sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. And, and I, I agree with you totally. I mean, sometimes I'd be writing and I just don't really get into it. And, and I, again, think you just have to be compassionate with yourself and say, okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, if I'm writing, sometimes I'll just do other things like I'll research stuff or whatever and, I, and I'll get things done. But I'm not getting into a flow state and really getting immersed in the activity. So, yeah, I think don't expect it to happen all the time, I would say, and give yourself permission to not be in flow, and then you'll probably find it'll happen more easily. Mm, that's, a, that's a really good tip. Give yourself permission not to. It's almost like relieve some of the pressure, mm. and then once the pressure is relieved, then some of the, some of the stress is removed. And then that potentially makes it a little bit easier to get into that flow state. What other tips do you have that people could take away that would help them to, shall we say, activate or reach that flow state more efficiently? Well, I think it's it's what I said is about setting up your environment for for it to be more likely to happen. You know, so that that can, you know, when you put that in the sporting context, you know, that so much of that as a as a coach working with somebody is also trying to create that environment that helps the learner to more likely to reach a flow state. And that can be ending from, you know, recognizing are they in their comfort zone or are they what I call in their stretch zone? And it's about knowing when to move, because if you just stay in your comfort zone, that's, that's not going to get you into flow. But there are times we need to be in our comfort zone. And there are other times we need to stretch ourselves. So, so there has to be a certain amount of stretching your performance in order to for flow to be more likely to happen so we call that the challenge skills balance and you, and you need a certain amount of challenge and, and that's why sports performers who are higher level performers tend to find flow more often because they're quite skillful and they can push and stretch themselves but if we take it away from sport it's just set up your environment you know just just get rid of distractions you know, if, if you're going to be, you know, so it's back to things like technology. If you're constantly getting interrupted, well, you've no chance of getting it to flow. It's just not going to happen. So something as simple as that is going to is going to help as well. But I, yeah, I think the the challenge aspect still has to be there in, in anything, you know, and that's so even go back to the writing. Well, there's a challenge, isn't there? You're trying to, you're getting, you're wanting to to craft something really nice you know there's there's nothing worse than you write something and you're really pleased with what you've written and then you you forget to save it or something and it's gone you know you imagine the frustration that comes from that but it's but there's that satisfaction when you're really into just just getting it written the way you want it written that's you sort of getting back into that that flow state but if you you've got to remove distraction i would say you know and then and then it's it's back to that well now Give yourself permission that it might take time to get into the flow state as well. It's not just going to happen straight away. Yeah, that's some really good advice. And you were thinking, you were speaking then about challenges and like the, and I've heard you speak previously about how the difficulty of the challenge can either help you to get into the flow state or hinder you from getting right. in the flow state. And this is something where, I remember hearing you say that and I was thinking back to an example of video games where they know exactly how to get people into the flow state by providing yeah. just enough challenge so that the game is so engaging that you're always yeah. just within reach of completing the level, but it's not so difficult that you put the phone down and say it's impossible. And they yeah. seem to have mastered this. So it seems like choosing the correct task of the right difficulty yeah, is also a really good way of making sure that we can access that state that we all desire all the time. I think. Yeah, no, I I think you're right. And the video game thing is a great example, and it, it's not something I've ever really done to any extent. Maybe I'm I'm the wrong era for that, but I can totally get it. I can, and that's where technology plays such a crucial role, you know. And and, and maybe there's there's probably something in that in terms of us helping people understand how to get into a flow state if you can just up that challenge and that, and as you say it's the game that's doing that so it's, it's that artificial intelligence that's doing it rather than a human having to make a decision and that and that's where the challenge 
I think it's a brilliant challenge in a way as a coach when you're working with somebody to know how to manipulate and to just push the person a little bit at the right time to stretch them, you know, because, you know, we're not going to get it absolutely right all the time. And and you go into the sports environment, into the world of snow sports, and that, that you need to be getting these decisions correct, you know, to the point that you don't put somebody in danger, you know, because it, so that there's a, it's much more important in that environment where you've got to, to make the right choice of what terrain to go on, et cetera. So, so that it is providing the challenge that they need without it being too much, but that it also isn't going to bore them. So it, it is that, 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 that skill in, in terms of the coach knowing how to challenge the person as well. So it's, it's one thing knowing how to challenge yourself, but it's also then as a coach knowing how to challenge the person you're working with. But, I think the most, and and you can maybe say if if this has happened to you as well in coaching, but the most gratifying or, or pleasurable experiences when you're coaching somebody and and you have that sort of session where you are both in flow, so both the the coachee and the coach or the learner and the coach are you're all having a flow experience. And, and, you know, and so in a in a given session, you know, you might be in flow and they're in flow. It might be at precisely the same time. It might be at different points within the session. But that that's a memorable session when when both of you experience flow. And for me, that's the the thing to strive for. That that's the one that excites me is when I can have a session where, you know, you come away. You don't you don't even need to review it that much because you know it's been a great session for both you and and the learner or the coachee. Yeah. You've really shed some light on this idea of flow so far today and really painted it in a way that I've never thought about before. And it's the natural thing to think about with flow is is very task based. And it's I did this thing, I was doing this task, and then all of a sudden an hour and a half went by. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, that's that seems like there's one type of flow, but there's also flow in terms of a flowing conversation like yeah. in terms of a coaching session the communication yeah. and something that i never think about in terms of flow is what you described earlier is hiking is for me personally who doesn't do that much hiking although i guess it goes back to my running analogy that's somewhere where i would probably find it more difficult to get into a flow state and i feel almost like it's challenging for me to picture exactly what a flow state would feel like on a hike when there is a lot of time there to think and a lot of stimulation. What what does flow actually feel like on something like a hike or a walk or a run as one of those longer events? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that a slightly distinction is to look at, again, go back to mindfulness and flow because the, the two have similarities but they're not necessarily the same. And, and so going back to my research study and the intervention that was a mindfulness intervention that I designed, but the idea of it was to help train people's attention skills because one of the, the key elements of mindfulness is being able to stay focused on something in the present moment and to stay on that, whether that's your breathing or just the environment that you're in and being aware. So it's, it's that it being able to keep your attention on, on a particular thing. Flow is similar to that in that the attention element is vitally important and being able to stay present moment on the task. I think what's, what I found in my research is that mindfulness is, is a little bit more effortful to stay focused. And when you move into the flow state, it becomes more effortless. It, it's almost like you're doing the activity, but you're not having to think hard about how you're doing the activity. You have the skills to match the challenge. But it, but generally, again, that's the defining aspect of flow is that there is some challenge there, as I say, whether that's physical, mental, or a combination of both. So, so you are challenging yourself a bit. It's not just a very passive activity, whereas you can be mindful and it be more passive and 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 the effort and mindfulness is more about so you're just that effort of staying on your breathing the whole time 
it takes effort to stay just focused on your breathing. But flow is just about having the skills to achieve the task and to just find it's, it's kind of effortless. Mm. I don't, does that make any sense? No, that's a really clear distinction between mindfulness and flow. And I feel like that's really beneficial. One thing that I was thinking about with flow is I was thinking back to school and I was a terrible student and I always did all of my homework at the last minute. And I found it impossible to get into that flow state when there were still two weeks left on the deadline. Yeah. But when it was when it was 11 p.m. and I had to hand in my assignment the next morning, I was in I was in flow. I didn't think about it like that. OK, it, yeah. What would normally take me six hours would take me 60 minutes. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's almost like the pre the intense pressure then put me into a state of flow and I was able to achieve the task almost effortlessly. How, what do you think about the relationship between deadlines and pressure and and flow and productivity? Yeah, again, it's it. I suppose I'd still come back to maybe it's an individual thing. You know, to, to, because I don't know that your scenario there is going to work for everybody. You know, so, and, you know, that that wouldn't have typically been how I was. I, I, I wouldn't have classed myself as a great student either going back to school days. But I, I was probably more, I've always been more of a want to get things done in time. I'll always turn up early to something. I'll always be, you know, wanting to be well on the road. And, you know, even when I go back to my more recent university thing, it, you know, I seem to be, further along with an assignment than some of my other cohort <laughs> than they were, whereas they would be probably more like you've just described and able and, and take a lot longer to kind of just keep going round in circles with ideas and then able to sort of pull it all together at the last moment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's, there's a right and a wrong strategy there. And, and, and so much of, so much of psychology and, and sort of mental skills is about learning well, how do we individually tick? How, how do we work? And and starting to understand that and, and work with that. Again, I'm, I'm sort of wondering if I've answered the question. And I'll... You know, when you were speaking, I was thinking back to the analogy that I gave. And, and, it's, and it's a really good point that flow and what motivates people to jump into action in those kind of situations is is very different. And I was thinking back to school and how the tasks where I was under pressure and then in flow because I was delivering the task at the last minute, these were tasks that I didn't want to do. This mm. was, you know, chemistry homework and stuff, which I, I really wasn't interested in. Yeah. I think about my life since school and the tasks that I have a positive mindset towards, I am able to access the flow state faster yeah. and more easily without that pressure. And I am well prepared. I wasn't I wasn't up late last night researching what we were going to talk about during this conversation. I already knew it a week ago. Right. Because it's something that I have a positive mentality yeah. towards and You're something interested. that I was looking forward to. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean and that's that is one of the dimensions of flow that, that you know I haven't mentioned, you know, flow is not is not my construct. It's it's been there for well, it's probably been there for a lot of life, but it was properly researched from about 1975 onwards by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Always a difficult name to pronounce, but, you know, and, and his nine dimensions of flow, one of those dimensions is is what he calls autotelism or autotelic personality. But that actually just means being intrinsically motivated to do something. And, and that's exactly what you're describing there. If you have more interest in it, and you just want to do the activity just for the sake of doing that activity, then then you're much more likely to be able to get it into flow, you know, in that particular activity than you would be if you're doing something that you're really not that interested in. And, and, and that's where it comes back to, well, if I'm doing something that's using my strengths and something that I enjoy and get energy from doing, then there's that intrinsic motivation there straight away. And, and so you're much more likely to find a flow state. Yeah, the trick is that is trying to, as I said, to to examine your life and find ways so that you are using your strengths and doing activities that you enjoy more of the time. You know, we're never going to get 100%, but if we can at least get the balance tip more in that 
so that that we're doing these things that we actually love doing, then then life's going to be a more a more pleasant ride, I suppose. Yeah, that's a that's a really great point, and I feel like a lot of, a lot of people come to me in my work as a coach, and they say, "I've got this goal, and there's this massive list of things that I need to do to achieve it, but I can't mm-hmm. do any of those things, and I just can't get them done, and I'm procrastinating, and this and that." And I say, well, how much do you enjoy doing those tasks? Well, I hate all of them. (laughs) Okay, so if you hate all of the tasks that are needed to get to the goal, is the journey even tolerable for you to actually reach the goal that you're perceiving that you want to achieve? And is it realistic to expect yourself to be able to jump right into action with all of those tasks all the time? Because it takes a lot of mental energy to do things that you don't enjoy. You know, you, you shared the example earlier about the accounts and that's also something that I don't enjoy. And that's something on my schedule that if it's coming around again to that time of year, it does get pushed back by a few weeks because I'm delaying the task because I don't want to. And then it actually, the mental energy of actually starting the task is more than actually doing the task itself. Yeah, And, And if accounting was on my schedule every day, then I feel like it would be very overwhelming for me to actually be able to get that task done. And for anybody that's out there who who feels like they're in that situation, something that I've worked on in my own life and also with a lot of other people who I've helped, it's, it's looking at the list of tasks that we have and then assessing which ones do I enjoy, which ones don't I enjoy. Can I do more of the things that I enjoy and less of the things that I don't enjoy? And when it comes to things we don't enjoy, some of them we might find that we don't have to do them because they're not mandatory some of them we might find that actually we could outsource them to somebody else if it's feasible and some of them we might find that there's actually a way to make them more enjoyable than they are at the moment yeah yeah i mean i I agree with everything you said yeah. yeah yeah so those are tactics where we can actually make the journey more enjoyable and if the journey's more enjoyable then we're more likely to stick it out long term which yeah. means that we can get to that goal that we want five years from now. Because at the end of the day, anything that's worth having in life long term takes a lot of consistency and dedication and commitment to the task at hand. So bloody hell, that's just a lot easier if it's actually enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And But I think in in structuring that journey, you also then have to keep coming back to well, why are you going for this particular goal? What are your reasons for it? And and I always say when you look at a goal, well, let let's list all of the reasons that you're working towards that goal. And how many of those are extrinsically motivated, and how many of them are intrinsically motivated? And if it's all extrinsic, and if it's all to please somebody else, or just for more money, or, or whatever it happens to be, then then you're up against it straight away, because it's going to be much harder to to stick it out. So you almost need to find intrinsic reasons why you're doing it. And then then the journey and the, some of the tasks you're doing are more likely to be ones that you you can get enjoyment out of doing. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And just an observation that I have after working with a lot of people who are trying to develop businesses is that people who are working in fields where they have intrinsic desire to succeed have a lot more success than people that are just doing it for money because when you Mm. have that intrinsic desire to succeed you'll work harder than everyone else because work doesn't feel like work so doing 12 hours work in a day actually feels like 12 hours doing something fun that you enjoy whereas the person who's suffering in what they're doing won't be able to stick it out to do the necessary hours to make the success so then and at the end of the day putting in a significant amount of effort and productivity is a prerequisite to being successful in any field. On top of that, if you really enjoy the task, then you're going to be really engaged with it. And then you're going to learn more. You're going to be in a flow state, which means you're going to increase your productivity, not only in terms of the amount of work you do, but actually the quality of work that comes out the other side will be more meaningful. And we both know from working in the coaching space that if if I turned up to a coaching session and I didn't want to be there because this isn't what I want to do with my life, then I'm not, I'm not going to be in the flow state and I'm not going to enjoy the conversation and I'm not going to turn up with the passion that is needed to be able to transmit some kind of motivation and some kind of change to the person on the other side of the phone. Yeah. If I'm turning up because I love what I do, I'm going to be animated, I'm going to be passionate, I'm going to give it 110%, I'm going to over-deliver on, my, on their expectations and their chances of success skyrocket off the back of off the back of that shift internally for me. And mm. I think that 
And I think that goes for every aspect of life and for any type of work that we put our effort into. So I always encourage people to try and find, and it's not always possible, like there's, we, we all have bills to pay and there's, we all have things that we have to do in order to be able to finance our lives, keep a roof over our heads, feed our families, et cetera, et cetera. But if there's a way where we can achieve all of those things and then also have some kind of intrinsic love for what we're doing for at least 70% of the time, for example, I think that's really the key to a, a long, happy and successful life and just overall good mental health, which at the end of the day yeah. is incredibly important. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. It, it is. I don't think you'll ever have a goal that's just totally intrinsic either. You know, it, it is going to have some extrinsic reasons as well. You know, as you say, you know, yeah, we need to earn money, you know, <laughs> so it's that might be part of the goal. As long as it's not the overriding only thing, reason you're doing it, then, you know, it's, it's got to be a sort of a, a dual process of intrinsic and extrinsic, I think. Mm. This is about feeling good about what we're doing and yeah. having that positive mindset and having mental good health rather than mental dis-ease. I know that positive psychology, positive mindset and good mental health is something that you're passionate about and something that you help people to work towards what really for you are the key foundations of good positive mental health i i mean i think it's again it's it's reframing certainly what what we understand as mental health to a certain extent because we're up against it with the media and society at the moment is because first of all they use the words mental health when they're actually talking about mental illness or mental disorder. So that that straight away gets us off on the wrong understanding of it. So they're always talking about, you know, poor men, you know, they're just using those terms. And actually, they should be saying mental illness, or, you know, mental disorder. And it's almost like society is still afraid to say that, you know, because people do, you know, and they still want to use, oh, it's a mental health problem. Why not use the term mental illness? <laughs> You know, because that is actually what the problem is. And if you differentiate the two, then we can sort of understand that there are lots of mental illnesses out there that people get. And that's part of life, depression being one of the biggest. But you can have a mental illness and yet still have good mental health. Now, that might not sound possible, but it is because they're not the same things. Our mental health is all about moving from zero, if you like, to upwards towards flourishing, as we would call it in, in positive psychology. So it's about all aspects of your life, holistically being good, and they're being good in the different areas of your life. So getting the right input, you know, every day, not just watching the, the terrible news that's out there. So if, if, if you're putting the wrong stuff into your mind all the time, you're going you're gonna to feel worse. So then you can come back down towards zero, but you could also then eventually end up with a mental illness. But it's, it's that differentiation, I think, is helpful straight off. We, we, so mental health for me and positive psychology, if you like, is about moving from this zero. If, if, if we've managed to get rid of mental illness, then it's from moving from zero upwards, you know, to to good mental health to, you know, to flourishing. And it's not just a case of if you don't have a mental disorder, you're mentally fine. That's not necessarily the case at all. You know, so so we, we can still get out of bed the next morning and I'm, okay, I'm not clinically depressed, but I don't necessarily feel great. You know, I'm not excited about the day. So it's more what can we do in our lives that makes us able to manage all the challenges that are there and and get more out of life so that, that we spend more of our time, you know, higher towards this, this sort of flourishing area rather than being at the other term that uses languishing when you're sort of down around zero. So we want to get from languishing to flourishing and, and keep up at that upper end as much as possible. Mm. And, the, and the way you describe it, I was just thinking about how much our, our external actions affect our mental health or mental illness whether that's going out and doing positive things that feel mentally healthy, whether that's exercise or flow activities or connection, or whether that's less healthy 
behaviors that cause us to go back down the spectrum towards <clears throat> mental dis-ease. And sometimes it sounds like mood really does follow the actions that we that we take. So yeah. it seems like action is a really important part of this. Yeah, um, no. yeah. definitely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's just, you know, something like exercise is massively important and studies show that, you know, if you can get out and do exercise it, I mean, there's, there's kind of chemical reasons for that, you know, which I, I would not be an expert on, but you know, that there's lots of reasons why getting out and exercising will make you feel mentally better. So, so it's important to push yourselves when you, when you don't always feel like it, but getting outside in nature is also shown to be a huge benefit to people. So, so yes, all of, all of these things. So yes, our behaviors, what we actually do will, will massively impact our, our overall well-being and, and certainly our mental health. And, and we can sort of keep it higher if we, if we, yeah. you know, employ better behaviors as it were. A hundred percent agree with that. And I think that's a, a really good takeaway for everyone is to get out there and do some of these things that make us feel complete and that will affect our internal mood. And that can help us to have mental health yeah. in the most positive sense of the word. Derek, this has been a really great conversation. What's the one most important thing that you would like people to take away from everything that we've spoken about today? I, I suppose one thing we haven't directly talked about but it, it sort of comes into it, it i would say is 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 to get people to remember that you can you can train the mental side of things just as much as you can train other things you know whether it's a physical activity or skill or whatever so it's it's don't you know we talked about it i suppose in meditation don't expect to just be good at the mental side of things if you don't practice it in some way how on earth do you expect to be good at it? And, you know, whether it's training your attention, whether it's, you know, getting the right mindset, all of it's trainable through, you know, actual steps and, and things that you can do. And, and, and that's why I wrote the, the more recent book, Six Steps for Training the Mind, because it is exactly that. It sets out, you know, different areas that we can work on to, to improve our mental skills. And, you know, one we haven't necessarily talked about, but I suppose, again, we have in the sense of our thought process, because our thought process is often involves us talking to ourselves and how we talk to ourselves is so important. So, so self-talk is it's a massive area, and, but you can get better at that. So I think the takeaway would be is, is you can become better at the mental skills. And therefore, that's, you know, apart from the other things we've talked about, that will be a an important part of giving you better just a more enjoyable life and and it does help you it also helps with be a trigger i suppose for flow you know the better we get at these mental skills so so yeah flow is something you want but don't expect it all of the time be patient with yourselves <laughs> be compassionate towards yourselves and yeah and, and just remember if you don't train it you're not going to get better at it i think those are those are brilliant words. And I'm not going to add anything to that because I think that was a, a, a perfect takeaway for everyone. Derek, I think that you're really talented in what you do and you've got such a rounded approach to everything and you have some really excellent thoughts around coaching and how you can improve the holistic lives of so many people in so many different ways. How can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about what you do, what you provide and, and your books and everything? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you uh, for those nice words. And it's been, you know, great to come on here and, and, and be part of this podcast. So, yeah, it's, you're doing a great job with it. But yeah, the, I mean, the simple way to get in touch is just Derek Tate Coaching FR, because I'm in France. And really everything is, is there within that website. So it's probably just the, you know, I'm obviously on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn, but, uh, you know, just Derek Tate Coaching would be the, the simple way to, to get in touch. Derek Tate Coaching. We will make sure to share all of your links along with this episode. And in the meantime, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. And I hope we have many more positive conversations in the future. So thanks so much for your time.